The first place, the one on Hennepin Avenue, had a porch. Most of the later places had porches too. The days were warm enough to sit outside. I think it was late May. Rick and I had started early, but it wasn't early anymore. By the end of rush hour, the cars gliding by in Hennepin started to melt into each other. And I was glad that neither one of us owned a car. By the time darkness fell, we ran out of limes. Every time we finished a Gilby's and Tonic, we stood up, stepped to the rail of the porch, and spit the lime wedges for distance. Rick finally fell asleep on the living room floor, and I flopped onto the porch couch. I slept, and I think it rained a little. During the night, the temperature dropped, and I woke up just before dawn, shivering in my t-shirt and jeans. I leaned up on my elbows and looked out toward the lawn and the intersection beyond. There was a thick ground fog, about two feet deep. I heard the faint quacking of ducks somewhere under it. I squinted a bit, and our building seemed to slip from its moorings and drift away from the phone booth. I laid back down and slept again. The next afternoon, Paul came home with Arthur. They filled the big red and white cooler and settled in on the porch. Rick and I wandered out when we heard the music and the sound of bottle tops opening. We drank a couple of fifers, and I told the other three my story of the ducks in the fog. After I stopped talking, Arthur said, This porch really is like the fantail of a boat. Rick mentioned that perhaps we should have life preservers available, considering the tendency of people to fall off the porch. At least a life boy with a name on it. Paul, who could actually sail, thought that we should start looking for dockage immediately. Arthur came back to safety issues and began to talk about appropriate modifications. I thought that the rail of the porch was the perfect place to mount one of those lights on a chrome stem, with one half a green light and the other half a red one. A foghorn seemed unnecessary, since there are already a couple of speakers outside. Someone mentioned grappling hooks, and the tide of the conversation began to shift towards smuggling, and everyone's passing acquaintance with that profession. The talk of fishing boats slipping into quiet harbors drifted into a discussion of the need for our vessel to be equipped with tackle, so that the sporting and nutritional needs of the crew could be met. Arthur observed that the head wasn't nearly close enough to the beer. Rick's suggestion to aim for the limes was vetoed in the interest of lowering our visibility. The rumble of the conversation moved toward a power source for this floating lounge, and I said that trolling was an appropriate metaphor for our direction. The undertow of reality and the problem of a power source moved the conceptualizing back to our actual porch. I thought that mounting a small electric trolling motor off one side of the porch was the best solution, and sketched a modified tiller attachment to allow steering from the couch. Arthur said he could rig it. We all agreed that a large galvanized tub full of water under the prop would provide a nice mix of surrealism, entertainment, and authentic sound. Question arose. How should we signify that we were underway, so that no accidents resulted from any ill-timed boarding attempts? Paul suggested a flag flapping in the wind. Rick thought an Apollo 11 type might be the ticket. I proposed a solution, and everyone agreed. Arthur would wire the motor switch to an electric fan facing out toward a stern-mounted flag. When the prop was engaged, the fan would kick in and our flag would snap in the breeze. After a while, all this nautical daydreaming faded, but we never completely forgot it. Over the course of almost seven years, nine or ten households, and thousands of lost hours, we forever after referred to ourselves as the Fantail Boys. The friendships lasted like a sailor's tattoo, a permanent reminder of what we salvaged from the eventual wreckage.